if there are any uh, kindergarten through fifth that uh, your family just uh, is okay with you going to our kids' fellowship classes, uh, if you've not already left, it's, you're free to leave. If I see any adults get up and leave, I will call you out. <laughs> uh, we are so glad that we get this opportunity to celebrate the Resurrection Sunday is what I like to refer to it as uh, with you today. And so I know we have many that are here that you are visiting as family. And so we want to say you're welcome and we're glad that you're here. Uh, there may be some of you that are here and maybe it's the first time you've been here and you're checking us out and you actually are from Jackson. Um, on that bulletin, uh, there was a tab at the bottom and it just has an opportunity for you to put your information on there so we can know who you are. Uh, we won't badger you, but we do want to be able to contact you to let you know more about who we are and how uh, we can be a blessing to you. So if that is you, feel free to fill out that card and you can put it at our uh, we have our tables out there in the foyer, uh, connect counters, and you can uh, leave it there. But I just want to make that mention to you. So, Resurrection Sunday, it's a glorious day. It's a great day to be here. I'm always uh, surprised, well, I guess I'm not really surprised at this time of the year. If you look at the History Channel and how the History Channel will have all kind of shows with all kind of individuals on there who will always try to disprove the resurrection. And they'll put some scholar on there that has all these degrees and they'll debate and they'll talk about how there's no way possible uh, that Jesus could have risen from the dead of himself and they have all these theories. I've often found that pretty interesting because if he's not real and if he didn't rise from the grave. Why do you feel like you have to have shows to try to disprove it? And so to me, it's we don't try to disprove the Easter Bunny or Santa Claus or anybody else of that nature. But when it comes to Christ, we try to disprove his birth and his resurrection. But if he's not real and he's not who he says he is, why do we bother? Right. The one thing, though, I never see them do is I never see them put a scholar on there and talking about this time of the year. I never see them put a scholar on there, talk about and defend a changed life. Because see, you can't debate a changed life. You can't change, you can't, de you can't debate the fact that somebody has had an experience with the resurrected Christ and their life is no longer the same. You can't, you can't question that. Well, we're going to find ourselves in the book of John chapter 20 as we're continuing this series on truth. And if you know much about the book of John, one of the major themes in this book is the concept of belief or to believe. Those concepts of belief and to believe, uh, most would say that you can see over 90 different times that John will convey those words, either belief or believing or the concept of believing. Over 90 times in his book. So it's a major theme. And so when we look at chapter 20, I'm kind of going to go backwards a little bit. We're going to look at verse 30 and 31 before we get into the beginning of chapter 20. But we read in chapter 20, verse 30 and 31, it says, Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. So John is giving us, in a sense, the purpose of why he wrote this book. We know that he wrote his gospel to the world, and he's writing, saying that Jesus did other signs. But I don't have enough, I don't have enough time to write. <laughs> I don't have that many books that I could write on all the different signs that he has done. But he has done some that aren't here. But the ones that we do have, and most think specifically, there are seven major miracles that we saw Jesus do throughout this book, that he's referring to those. And he says, but these are written, why? So that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. And by believing, you may have life in his name. The question we have to ask ourselves is, who 
is the you in that verse. Well, John's gospel, unlike Matthew's, who was written to the Jews, and Mark, who was written to the, uh, uh, to the Romans, and, and Luke, who was written to his, to the, primarily to the Gentiles, or the Greeks, what we need to see is that John wrote his book to the world. So this is a verse for you. This is a verse written to me. His desire through this book was to show the miracles that Jesus did. Why? So because always miracles validate a message. And what was Jesus' message? That I am the Christ. That's his official office as the Messiah. But he's also the Son of God. So we see his humanity and his, and his deity. But notice, and by believing, you may have life. See, many may try to question the resurrection. Did it really happen? Was he really dead when he got put in the tomb? All these different theories. But nobody can question a changed life. And when you come to experience and have an experience with the resurrected Christ, it's not just believing him as the Christ, the Son of God, but it's by believing you will have life in his name. I, I would like to show you three different uh, individuals, one is a group of, of people, but then two other individuals, but three encounters with Jesus, the resurrected Christ. Look with me in verse 1 of chapter 20. We meet the first individual who will have an encounter with the resurrected Christ. And what I want you to see is that each of these individuals, after they come to Jesus with a certain issue, and they will, meet, they will meet the resurrected Christ and they will leave changed. It may be something that we need to hold on to today. Because maybe you have come into this place and you've got something that you brought with you into this place. And my hope is that after you have experienced and encountered the resurrected Christ, you too will leave changed. So now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, just thought that this is John speaking of himself, and said to them, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb and we do not know where they have laid him. So Peter went out to the other disciple and they were going toward the tomb and both of them were running together. But the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. And stooping to look in, he saw the linen cloths lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb. He saw the linen cloths lying there, and the face cloth, which had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went in, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture, that he must rise from the dead, then the disciples went back to their homes. So here's the scenario. Mary has come to the tomb. The other gospel accounts will, will mention that there is other women. But we see in John's account, <clears throat> he specifically mentions Mary Magdalene. And she's come. She was a follower of Christ. She was one who loved Christ. She loved Jesus. Her passion was to follow him, and, and, and she believed in who he said he, he was, and she wanted life with him. So she comes, to, in a sense, to pay her respects, to mourn. And as she approaches the tomb, she sees that the stone is rolled away, and she is troubled. Because, you see, they would roll the stone in front of the grave, and, so, and it was usually sealed by the governor's seal of the day. And you didn't touch it. But she sees the stone is rolled away. So her initial thought, her misconception, is that somebody has stolen the body. Or even the best case scenario, someone has came and taken his body and buried it somewhere else. That she didn't know where it was. And so she goes. She tells the disciples. Why Peter and John? We don't really know, but that's who she tells. They both go and I, I believe that the reason why John writes how he writes is to let us know that when they got there, 
They knew that Jesus, you would wrap him in these cloths. And then you would have a shroud that went around your, your, your head area. And he's very specific, John is, by letting us know that when they got there, not only was the body gone, but it's almost as if the clothes were laid out just as if his body raised up out of them. And the face cloth was taken and was folded over here separately. Who would do that if you were really still in the body? That doesn't make any sense. You wouldn't take time to make sure everything was left in perfect condition. You're definitely not going to take off it and fold it up and put it nice and neat. Most of y'all don't even fold your clothes, right? So you're not going to come in here and do that. So he tells us this, I believe, because he wants us to know that he hasn't been taken. He hasn't been buried somewhere else. No, he did what he said he would do, and he rose from the grave. But in this moment, she has got sorrow. How do we know? Look at verse 11. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. And as she wept, she stooped to look into the tomb and she saw two angels white sitting there where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head and one at the feet. And they said to her, woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, they have taken away my Lord and I do not know where they have laid him. Having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing, but she did not know that it was Jesus. So she is in a state of sorrowness. Maybe you've come in here and you have experienced things in your life that have brought you sorrow. They've brought you hurt. They've brought you pain. Maybe you're here today and there's things in your life that have happened outside of your control and you don't understand why. That's where Mary is. She doesn't understand why someone would come and take his body. Why would they take it away where she didn't know where it was? And she is sorry. She, she's demonstrating sorrow and she's weeping. We know that it says she stood weeping in verse 11. In verse 13, uh, she is uh, questioned by the angels. Why are you weeping? Here's a note within this passage. There is no weeping at the resurrection. There's no need for us to cry at the resurrection. Because there's hope and there's joy that has come from that resurrection. But what we see here is that she's weeping. And it, she says that, it says there that uh, they have taken away my Lord. In verse 14, she turns around and she sees Jesus standing. But she, does, she doesn't know who he is in this moment. She doesn't know who he is. So he reveals himself to her by this. Verse 15, Jesus said to her, woman... Why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Don't you like that question? He didn't say, what are you seeking? Who are you seeking? Jesus knows her heart. He knows that she is weeping because of him. And listen to this. She's supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him and I will take him away. She thinks this individual who John identifies as Jesus is just the gardener. He's an individual that happens to be there. And she's thinking, well, maybe you know where his body is. Maybe you had something to do with it. Just let me know where it is and I will, I will take care of it. Verse 16, Jesus said to her, Mary. He just says her name, Mary. See, John earlier in the scriptures in John chapter 10 lets us know that Jesus is the good shepherd. He lets us know that he knows his sheep and that they know his voice. See, he knew Mary was his and he just simply said, Mary. And in that moment, she turned and said to him in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. And for her, it was a place of, it was a position of authority. And so he says to her, do not cling to me for I have not yet ascended to the father, but I go to my, but go to my brothers and say to them, I'm ascending to my father and your father and to my God and to your God. When she realizes it's Jesus, she doesn't want to let him go. <laughs> She's afraid in this moment that if I let you go, I may not ever get to see you again. And Jesus lets her know, don't cling to me. Part of it is because, yes, he hadn't fully ascended into heaven. Um, 
But more importantly, it's because he has a plan and a purpose for her life. See, when you come to meet the resurrected, resurrected Christ, not only does he change your life, but he changes your mission. He gives you and puts you on, puts you on his mission. And for Mary, he wanted her to do his mission. Don't cling and stay with me. No, I need you to go. And notice how he refers to his disciples, to my brothers. What did the resurrection do that maybe you didn't realize? A lot of times when we look at the resurrection, we know that Jesus lived, he died, and he rose again from the grave. My sins are forgiven. My opportunity to be with a holy God and right before him has been made clear. And if I have a right relationship with him, I have eternity with him in heaven. But when Jesus rose from the grave and you put your faith and trust in Jesus, you become a part of his family. You become a part of his family. The Bible would tell us we become his sons and we become his daughters. That we become heirs, co-heirs with Christ. See, when I die, those things that I have will be left to my children. That's why you better pray hard. Because things I have are going to be left to Ezra and Joe, and that's scary. But because they're my kids, what I have is theirs. And when Christ came, he lived and he died and he rose again of himself from the grave to provide you and I the opportunity to have salvation. If you have accepted him as your savior, then what he has is also yours. And it's also mine. And we get to be a part of his family. He tells her to go to my brothers. And what, what does she just say to them? I'm ascending to my father and your father. See, it's not just my father anymore. No, now, because you believe in me, Mary, it's your father. He's your father. And not only is he my God, he's your God. Because what the Son has done on your behalf, you and I now get to take part in it. 2 Corinthians 8 9 would say it this way, He who was rich became poor, that through his poverty you and I may become rich. And he was a carpenter, so we know he wasn't talking about his day-to-day -day job. No, he gave up who he was to become one of us through becoming one of us and dying the death that you should have died and living the life that you and I should have be living. We get the opportunity to have a right relationship with God the Father. Mary dealt with sorrow. What does the Bible have to say about sorrow? Well, John will say in chapter 16, 20 and verse 22, he says, Truly, truly, I say to you, you weep and lament, talking to his disciples, but the world will rejoice. You will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will turn into joy. He says in 22, So also you have sorrow now, but I will see you again, and your hearts will rejoice, and no one will take your joy from you. But we can live each and every day and we can allow the devil, we can allow others to steal our joy, can we not? And the scriptures tell us that we have no reason to be sorrowful. We have all the reason to be joyful. Why? Because our Savior is no longer in the grave. No, He has risen. And because He has risen, sorrow no longer has control over me. And that sorrow gets to be turned into joy because of our encounter with a resurrected Jesus. Well, there was a second group. It says in verse 18, Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord, and that he said these things to her. Look at verse 19. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked. That's a key word. Where the disciples were, why is the door locked? The scriptures tells us, for fear of the Jews. Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld 
So here's our second encounter with the resurrection, with, with the resurrected Savior, with Jesus. And his encounter is with the disciples. What are the disciples going through right now? They're going through fear. Fear has gripped them. And I know from personal experience, fear will enslave you if you allow it to. And these men are allowing fear to enslave them to where they're not living life as they should. The door was locked. The disciples were fearful for the Jews. They were afraid. They saw what happened to Jesus, and they're thinking, hey, if they find out that we're with him, that may happen to us. And they're afraid. He comes to them and says, peace be with you. It's thought that he first says, peace be with you, to kind of calm them down, to kind of give them some reassurance that, hey, it's going to be okay. It says, when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. He wanted them to see that, that I am who you think I am. I really did die, but I rose again from the grave. Here's the proof. And because of this, the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Verse 21, Jesus said to them again, peace be with you. It's thought that he says it the second time because I know you're happy. I know you're glad, but understand that there's a cost. There's a cost to following me. Notice he says this, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And just as God the Father sent Jesus the Son to come and to declare to the world the truth of God's love, the truth about sin, the need for repentance, and the fact that it cost him his life, it may cost you your lives as well. Is what he's telling them. So I know you're happy and excited, <laughs> but when you look at the story and the history of the disciples, every last one of them died horrific deaths for the sake of Christ. The author of this book, John, they tried to kill him several times and they couldn't do it. <laughs> so they stuck him on an island. He was the first castaway. <laughs> took him on an island by himself. Some of y'all get that later. You know, Wilson, Tom Hanks. Anyways, but he's by himself until he, until he dies. And so we see here fear has gripped these disciples. But after they encounter the resurrected Jesus, we know their history, and now they go out with courage because they have had an encounter with the resurrected Christ. What does the Bible say about fear? David says it this way in Psalm 27, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? If God is for you, Scripture will tell us who can be against you. But I think so many times as believers, we can forget the power that we have by being connected to our Savior. See, you, I'll take my chances, me plus God, I'll take my chances between anybody in the world. I like my odds. Psalm 49.5 says, Why should I fear in times of trouble when the iniquity of those who cheat me surrounds me? Hebrews would say it this way, so we can confidently say, the Lord is my helper, I will not fear. What can man do to me? Revelation 1.7 says, when I saw him, John speaking, the same guy, speaking of a vision he had of God in Revelation, he says, when I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead, but he laid his right hand on me saying, fear not, I'm the first and the last. I'm the beginning and I'm the end. I'm the alpha and I'm the omega. I started this thing and I'm going to finish it. And so you don't have to be afraid. And I know many of you have stepped into this room today. And the one thing that's holding you back from being the individual that the Lord needs you to be is fear. And you're letting fear enslave you. Hebrews would say that that enslavement to fear is from the devil. 
the devil will do whatever he can to enslave you to fear. Because then fear causes you to go inward where the Bible calls us to be upward and outward. You should love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. That's the upward. And you should love your neighbor as yourself. That's the outward. It never says you should love you and be all about you. And say that. But when I went through my depression, that's what fear did to me. It took me inward, where all I cared about was myself and my immediate family. That's all I cared about. It gripped me and enslaved me. And it's amazing that I was allowing myself, and you are as well, if you allow fear to enslave you to that which the scriptures tell me Christ has already freed you from. Sorrow gets turned to joy when you meet Christ. Fear gets turned to courage when you meet Christ. And now we get Thomas, verse 24 and following. Now Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, has thought that his twin was possibly even Matthew, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails, and place my finger in the mark of the nails, and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. Eight days later, his disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them. And although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here, and see my hands, and put out your hand, and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. And Jesus said to him, If you believe because you have seen me, blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. See, what do we have here? We have, he gets labeled a lot, Doubting Thomas. And that's where people get that concept, Doubting Thomas. I don't much think he was much of a doubter as much as he was skeptical. See, I believe Thomas had a clear understanding of who Jesus was. And the reason why he couldn't believe it and he would never believe it unless he saw him because Thomas was willing to surrender it all to Jesus. And so in a sense, he's saying, if this is really you, if he really came, then I've got to see it for myself. So I don't know as much if he was doubting as much as he was skeptical. But notice he has this encounter with Jesus Jesus was not there earlier when Thomas said, unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails and place my finger into the mark of the nails and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. Jesus was not there when Thomas said that. Yet when Jesus shows up, doors locked, it's a supernatural uh, experience right here of an encounter with Thomas. Notice that Jesus knows Thomas's thoughts. Though he wasn't there with Thomas earlier, a week earlier, he's there now and he knows exactly what Thomas had said. That's why we know Jesus is God. How else would he know that? And he tells Thomas, that which you are saying is keeping you from believing in me, I'm going to go ahead and take that away from you. From you. Touch. Look. See. It's me. So what does Thomas do? Well, Thomas some can say he's doubting. Some can say, I believe he's skeptical. But what happens when a, a skeptical, doubting individual meets a resurrected Christ? What happens is that skepticism and that doubt gets turned into a correct profession of faith. So he was skeptical. Some may say he's doubting. But after he met with Christ... He answers him, my Lord and my God. A correct profession of his faith. That you're my Lord, I give you authority and surrender my life to you. Why? Because you are my God. And that's what an encounter with the resurrected, resurrected Jesus will do for you. John 14, 9 says that if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So Jesus is letting him know that I am him. Matthew 21, 21 says, And Jesus answered them, Truly I say to you, if you have faith and do not doubt, you will not only do what has been done to the fig tree, it was a fig tree that was an uh, analogy he was using here in Matthew, but even if you say to this mountain, be taken up and thrown into the sea, 
it will happen. See, the opposite of skepticism, the opposite of doubt, is genuine faith. And where does faith come from? Scriptures tell us faith comes from hearing, and hearing comes from the Word of God. Romans 10 and 17. That's where it comes from. Well, you may be sitting here and you say, well, John, those are some great examples. Uh, you've shown us some, some, some great examples of, uh, of how Jesus can help with sorrow and how Jesus can help with fear and how Jesus can help with doubt or skepticism. And you've shown us these people of Mary, the disciples, and Thomas. Man, that was back during the Bible times. That was back when Jesus walked the earth. Well, if I've not shown you clearly that if you want to have a changed life, it's only found through the person of Jesus Christ. If there's nothing I've said thus far that will convince you of that, maybe hearing from these individuals will. Hi, my name is Joanna, and... I grew up in a Christian home and around seven I got baptized and Jesus came into my life and but once I started getting older it just kind of I just started noticing all the bad things that were happening in this world it was just confusing to me why would God let this happen and so it took me in this time of doubt and I just was questioning so many things and then at one point, my dad was telling me that I should read this book called Why So Many Gods. And I started just reading probably a chapter every day. And it just came to me that all these religions just seemed crazy. And Christianity just seemed like the one that would really make sense. And it just made me notice that even though all these things were happening and God were letting bad things happen to these people, it just made them have a closer relationship with Him. And even people who already had a relationship, they would probably speak to Him more, pray to Him more, and it would just bring them closer to Him. And the people who didn't believe in Him, it would definitely bring them to Him. I think that was really what helped me notice. Through knowing that Christianity, Christianity was true, it just helped my doubt. And now I don't really have as much doubt. And when I do have doubt, I know that God, He knows what He's doing. And it helps me believe. Good morning, my name is Bobby Witherspoon. I want to share something this morning about what the enemy has used on, a weapon that the enemy used on Christians all over the world, and that's fear. I went to church with my great-grandmother, and she used to take me to church all the time, but as I got older, I stopped going to church, and I went my, my own way in the world and did my own thing. In 2010, God called me. God called me, and I changed my life. I was on fire for God, and I started walking with God and loving on God, and God was blessing me, and everything was going so great and well. But I also went through some hardship times. Uh, my house, my, my apartment burnt up, and I lost everything, all my clothes and TV, stereos, everything. Everything I collected throughout the years, just gone. And I, and I prayed, and, and I was full of fear, and I, and, I, and, I, and I was losing faith. I didn't understand, and, and, and I went through things with family members being on drugs and alcohol, and I was praying that God would deliver them. And things just was, just, it just, the, the enemy was working. And, but God, he came to the rescue, you know. Um, and I just thank God for that. But you got to trust in him and have faith. Fear is the contradiction of the word of God. Fear is disbelief, unbelief. And um, not trusting that God is going to do what he said he's going to do. The word of God is the seed of faith. And um, contradiction is the seed of fear. You know, God didn't give us a spirit of fear, but he gave us a spirit of love. I'm talking about a love so powerful that it'll cause you to love your own enemies. And that's powerful. Fear contaminates. 
faith. You know, when you are, when you are established in righteousness, you should have no fear. And that's the truth. When you fear, you open up the door for the enemy to come in. And he want to come in your life and, and make all kind of negative things happen so that you won't trust God. But God will destroy fear. Trust me. The Bible says there is no fear in love. But perfect love casts out fear. And fear involves torment. But he who fears has not been made perfect in love. You know, that's what the Bible says. You know, Romans says that if God be for us, then who can be against us? So we have nothing to fear. Trust God. I just want to reach out to the saints and the people of God today and, and um, let them know that... Uh, Keep pushing forward and don't give up on God because he won't give up on you. For those of you who don't know me, uh, my name is Sarah Story and I've been a member at Fellowship South since we opened. Today my story is about um, the loss of my twin boys. Um, last year, by the grace of God and a really great fertility doctor, I. Um, got pregnant with um, twin boys um, and then in December on December 17th I had gone to work and um, just kind of felt off nothing nothing specific I went to my doctor later that day because I just kind of started feeling worse throughout the day and he told me it was just pregnancy and go home and rest and everything would be fine being a doctor I kind of felt like you know I knew something was wrong but I didn't know really know what was wrong so I actually just laid there and I started praying and in about probably five minutes time I started to have um, full-blown contractions like um, pretty continuous and one of the perks of being a doctor at Jackson General is I called the ER ahead of time and said I'm coming in meet me in the ambulance bay and they had a wheelchair for me and they rushed me upstairs just as I mean as fast as the man could run really um, I'm kind of one of those people who no matter what it is I think everything happens for a reason I mean I had cancer when I was 28 and I know that happened for a reason um, so I just was laying there and I basically said, God, I'm not going to worry about it. If I worry about it, it'll just stress my body more. And right now the stress of this is the least thing that they, these boys need. So I just said, you got this and whatever your will is, it's going to happen. Um, so did okay for about three days. And on the fourth day that I was there, um, I went back into labor. Um, and at that point it was kind of a no turning back. So. Um, both my boys were delivered about 1.20 and 123 in the morning on December 20th. Um, um, my first boy, Cade, he was still born, but um, Wyatt was born alive, and so I did get to hold him for a little while. Um, but then I had some complications and had to go into emergency surgery. And a lot of people think, I don't know, I guess that I would be mad at God for doing this to me or taking them away from me, and I really never felt like that. For me, it's more, I had this picture all the time of that Bible story where Jesus is in the boat, but he's asleep and he's, you know, no one's trusting him. And they wake him up and say, why aren't you going to help us? You got it. And he wakes up and says, calm down. And then the storm goes away and everything is okay. And even though I feel like um, he didn't necessarily wake up and make my problem go away, I, I knew he was there with me all the time. And he's been with me every day since to help me get better. Doubt, fear, and sorrow. All three individuals who were able to move past, not that those issues are never going to be forgotten, but they were, able, they were able to move past. Why? Because they previously had an encounter with the resurrected Jesus. When you look at that passage of Scripture that we studied, there's three things that are true within that passage. We end with Thomas, and we get the word believe. You go up to the disciples... And they were giving courage and they went out because they received the Holy Spirit. And then we get to Mary. She was told to leave. Go. Tell.
tell my brothers that I've risen. And when I think about the resurrection, what I want to encourage you today about the resurrection is to understand that every gospel account doesn't just end with the resurrection. No, it ends with the going and the spreading out of the gospel. Because yes, Jesus did rise from the grave. Yes, Jesus is sitting at the right hand of the Father. But if I just keep it to myself, then he died in vain. We here today, maybe you're part of one of those three. Maybe you're here and you need to believe in Christ as your Savior for the first time. And you need to say, yes, you're my Lord. And yes, you're my God. I'm tired of handling my problems on my own. And I need you to take over. I'm tired and I'm weary. And I need to just say, I'm sorry. Forgive me of my sins. And you just need to turn it over to him. You need to believe. Maybe you're in here and you have a head knowledge. You have a USA gospel card. And you've been in church and you know everything that there is to be said. But there's no change in your life. Maybe you need to receive the Holy Spirit. And you need to understand that it's not just a head knowledge, but no, it's a heart change. But maybe you're in this room today and you believe you've received Christ. But you need to leave. You need to take what you know to be true and you need to go and give it away and share it with somebody else. Believe, receive, and leave. That's what the resurrection should mean to all of us in this room. We have a cross here. and You were handed a piece of paper and hopefully a pen. It could be a sin that you're dealing with. It it could be a struggle that you have. But as Nathan plays this last song and sings through, we want to give you the opportunity to take time on this Resurrection Sunday. To take time, if you want, you don't have to do it, but if you would like to write something on that piece of paper, Maybe it's a sin. Maybe I said something you're struggling with. Maybe it's a request. Whatever it may be. Maybe it's sorrow. Maybe it's fear. Maybe it's doubt. Write it down. And as this song plays, you can come up and you can clip it to the cross. The only thing I ask of you is that whatever it is that you do and write and you clip to the cross, then when you turn around and leave, you leave it there. You don't put it on the cross and come back down and and take it with you. Now you come to the blood-stained feet because it's there where you'll find the grace that will set you free. So this time is your time. And then we'll close.